As we move deeper and deeper into the hard-to-hold open portions of the end of this book, we find yet more bland and boring letters from Paul, Philippians, and Colossians. In fact, if you told me these were actually the same letters as the last two, but they'd switch the order of the chapters or something, I'd be hard-pressed to dispute it. Yeah. Even after Paul's first five letters set up the perfect scenario for more identical letters, these two seem to fall flat <laughs> somehow. It's disappointing. Now, normally I'd spend a few seconds on a quick summary of the books we're about to go over, but since absolutely nothing happens in them, there's nothing to summarize, and I can just skip straight to introducing my lovely wife, Lucinda. Lucinda, welcome back. Did they just not have etc. back then? <laughs> really, you could have just ended yeah. Romans with etc. etc. and we could have skipped straight to Revelations and been done with it. Would have been nice. Just check those annals of the kings of Judah, you're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but instead, we're stuck with Paul sitting in a prison somewhere and scrawling out a letter to the Philippians, or Philippians. Right. So we start with more of the same flattering bullshit that Paul opens every letter with. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but notice that we aren't five sentences in before Paul tells the Philippians that at least one of them will still be alive when Jesus returns to earth. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then in verse 18 of chapter one, he also makes it perfectly clear that it's okay to be full of shit as long as you're full of shit for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And Paul's writing this from a prison. So mm -hmm. at first it just seems all self-pitying when he whines about being in prison for his love of Christ. But by the end of it, it feels a little less like arrogance and a little more like an overzealous effort to say, don't believe the people who say I was arrested for stumbling around drunk with my dick out. <laughs> right. That's ridiculous. Doing the naked marathon. I got diverted. I don't know what I <laughs> happened. Yeah, so he's sitting there in a jail cell, and he's writing this delusional rant about how he can't decide if he should let the jailers let him go or if he should let them execute him, both of which would be good options for advancing Christianity, so it's a tough call for him. It's like, it's like a magician who fucked up the big illusion hours ago, <laughs> and he's like he's still bantering with the audience about how it's all part of the trick. Yeah, as right. You can see, I'm <laughs> actually saw it in half now, but uh, as you all know, double amputations help out Jesus. So <laughs> that's why we're here. So Jesus. Then in chapter 2, Paul breaks into song mid-letter. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a whole little hymn there. Basically a desperate attempt to hit the word count. He, he basically just, he's, he's, it's like his, his scribe is probably saying, like, you know, can I just say hymn number so-and-so? Do we have to actually write this all out? He's like, yeah, write it out, write it out. I'm going <laughs> to sing it to you. I'm going to sing it to you. He's like, I know the words. There's an inordinate amount of passive-aggressive compliments, too. Like when he says, I'll send Timothy around to check on you, since nobody on earth except me and Timothy give a shit about you. Right. Oh, good. I've been wondering when this was going to happen in the Bible. This is where Christians finally get a much-needed lesson on how to be more of a self-righteous asshole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2.15 tells everyone to just shut up and follow instructions in the Bible, quote, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, end quote. Pretty sure that was Dylan Roof's ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then he tells them, oh, hey, you guys remember Epaphroditus? The guy who, uh, the, with the near-fatal communicable disease that I was telling you about, I'm going to send him your way, too. Make sure you give him Be a hug and a big really sloppy soon. kiss there. <laughs> yeah, and then in chapter 3 has this bizarre opening where Paul warns the Philippians to avoid dogs, evil workers, and flesh mutilators. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems like dogs got the shit end of the stick here. Yeah, you don't really. need to tell people avoid evil people and s flesh mutilators. <laughs> yeah, right. The dog thing, though. <laughs> Although, oh, I've got to admit, this part came with a rare piece of common sense advice from the Bible. Paul's basically saying, you know, we've been kind of vague, baiting the pros and cons, but we're going to make an official call on this. Don't let any dudes mutilate your penis. Don't right. do that. We're doing it. <laughs> Trust me, I used to be a Jew, and that kind of thing can get botched. I've heard. Yeah. I've heard it. <laughs> Finally like put the hamper down on that one. And then, and then he says a lot of confusing nonsense about how great Jesus is, mm -hmm. which you, I was you dying could have for. just summarized this entire testimony. Yeah, yeah right, right. No, yeah, we've had plenty it. of that. But there's also this weird thing where he keeps forgetting that he's supposed to be okay with dying. Mm -hmm. you know, he's not sure if he's going to get killed or whatever for whatever landed him in prison, the naked dick flopping around or the uh, love in Jesus, whichever it was. So he keeps saying shit like, Man, I really hope I don't die. And then he's got to backtrack for a few paragraphs. And, I, and by that, I mean that I really don't give a shit. And it's totally <laughs> fine if I die because Jesus in heaven and yada, 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 which will be way better than this life that I'm desperately clinging to. But, woo, boy, it would be nice to also not die so that, you know, I can hang out with you guys again or something. Don't get me wrong. I cannot wait to be tortured and killed. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then right. again, then again, God. if I skip that stuff, there's no chance I'd be stepping on the Savior's toes. <laughs> <laughs> 
horrible death is kind of his thing. He doesn't want me to. So hard to decide. I can't out decide or out torture Jesus. I mean, come on. <laughs> and and this annoys the fuck out of me. Almost all of the moral advice in the epistles is completely meaningless. It's like mm-hmm. getting directions from my sister in law. And they'll just say, like, turn at Main Street with no reference to, like, left, right, north, <laughs> south, or anything like that. Oh, oh. It's stuff like, it's like, stand firm in the Lord. Like, what the fuck does that <laughs> even mean? Make sure to have a rock-solid erection if you're going to penetrate him? I mean, well, how the hell does that kind of advice help anybody? Common right. sense, yeah. Keep driving for about 45 minutes. Doesn't matter what speed. Whatever speed. 45 minutes, no matter what. <laughs> then take the fork and, um... <laughs> When you cross the railroad tracks, it means you're not there yet. Stop giving me useless information. You've gotten directions from her, too. (laughs) Or if it's not that vague, meaningless stuff, it's way too specific. Like, and take care of these two lady friends of mine until I get out of here. Yeah, prison. right. <laughs> now, there's a moral lesson you can apply to your day-to-day life. Well, right? that yeah. is, actually. That yeah. is. There's also, like, repeated reminders to be exactly like Paul. Mm-hmm. Be more like, when in doubt, be more like me. Ask yourself, what would I do? <laughs> and we were asking you, and you just said, You'd stand go to firm jail. in the Lord. <laughs> right. I'd for be running in around jail naked. <laughs> with my dick hanging out. Right. There's also these parts that read like he's writing to a girl that broke up with him back in high school, but he still hasn't quite taken the hint yet. In chapter 4, verse 10, he says, quote, Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. End of quote. Like, isn't that something they should tell you? Right, yes. Isn't that from Paul's end exactly like them not giving a pigeon's turd about him? Yeah, right. Exactly. He's rationalizing Not me, it's you. Yeah. And just when I thought this book had absolutely nothing to offer, I noticed this little theological nugget at the very end. I'm sorry, nugget, not nugget. (laughs) Paul's thanking the, the Philippians for sending a gift for him while he's in prison, and there's this description that he gives of the gift. Quote, I am fully satisfied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me a flagrant offering a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to the lord end quote now for most people that would be completely meaningless and like me for example yeah right <laughs> okay right but, but christians always wave away all the crap that the bible says about splashing blood against the altar by saying that jesus's death was the ultimate sacrifice and after that mm-hmm. there was no further need to kill bulls and all that other shit so why is paul the chief architect of their religion sacrificing shit and I guess we get to close on that little puzzler because that's all Philippians we get. That's it. Yeah, but Over. have yeah. no fear because we have way more exact same shit coming up <laughs> with Colossians. Again, etc. That's all we need. <laughs> Done, guys. So unlike Philippians, there, there's a lot of debate about the authorship of Colossians. Most biblical scholars agree that the former was actually written by Paul, but the latter has all the hallmarks of a forgery. And there'd probably be a lot more consensus on that if, if none of the Bible scholars were Christians. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I, I can understand where Christian scholars are coming from. If Paul didn't write all these letters, the otherwise cogent narrative of the Bible really starts to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, right. so people might have reasons to doubt its veracity at that point. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> So this one starts with the typical several pages of ass-kissing we've come to expect from Pauline epistles. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's a little more passive-aggressive than usual. He says a lot of stuff like, ever since we heard about you guys, we've been praying that you would be smarter than you are now. And I'm (laughs) sure you'll get there eventually. (laughs) Keep praying. It's going to work. And there's also a little sprinkling of, like, remember before you were Christians when you were evil and worthless? There's a lot of that in there, Mm -hmm. too. And this is where we learn that God is finally getting a little too senile to fulfill his duties. Mm -hmm. So they had to put him in a home, I guess. (laughs) Therefore, Jesus now has power of attorney over all that old Jewish stuff. Yeah, right. (laughs) Which, by the way, doesn't count anymore. Never happened. Smart move, legally, that they made there. Omnipotence is, I don't think that word means what they think it means. And then you get a quick reminder that you just can't trust any of those other motherfuckers that they that say other stuff. They're full of shit. You know they're full of shit. Yeah, and this has become a big pet peeve for me. And we get it all through the New Testament. Paul, or whoever's pretending to be Paul for the purposes of this letter, says, yes, even before you were born, you were sinful and broken, but uh-huh. God has forgiven you. So if I build a porch and the porch collapses, I get to blame the porch, right? Yeah, right, right, exactly. Not my fucking You, fault. random stranger there, I just decided you owe me a million dollars, and I've also elected to forgive your debt. How awesome am I, <laughs> huh? Huh? Forgiving what debt? Exactly. Well done. <laughs> Here's your bill. It's about 10% of your lifetime earnings. Yeah, an occasional bull. Very also, well. and this is important, don't be fooled by human ways of thinking. <laughs> it actually brain. says that. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't worry about that shit. Or listen to the assholes that say you can't drink bleach. Yes, because you can, <laughs> damn it. Yeah. 
Go for it. And uh, just one last thing on chapter two. I think verse nine is worth mentioning, considering how often it seems to get misinterpreted by priests. It says, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeah. So I guess they're saying God is inside Jesus, but just the tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we I think get that's a, a misreading. Yeah. And then we get one of those rare morality bits. Yeah. But it's just more self evident mm-hmm. shit. Like I'm reading through it thinking, you know, some poor dude had to carry this letter all the way to Colossae or whatever the hell it's called just to remind them that God doesn't like malice, evil deeds, and greed. Yeah, but if you keep reading, you get to the less moral shit it's signaled yeah. by the verse that's currently used to justify marital rape. By the way. One of the verses <laughs> that's currently used to justify marital rape. Now, in fairness, though, that passage also says the wife is allowed to be, you know, somewhat resentful <laughs> within reason, within reason. <laughs> About the non-consensual sex. And the husband isn't supposed to take it out on her. Right, yes. Beyond uh-huh. the original raping. So or, or future rape. It's rapes. nice. You know, there's a little bit of a feminist message coming through. <laughs> right. Signs through at the end. Right. But that's just there to warm you up for the full-throated slavery endorsement you get at the end of chapter three. Yeah. This is where we get the whole uh, slaves obey your masters even when they aren't looking because God's still watching you and he's judging you by how vigorously your enslaved ass is scrubbing those decks. <laughs> Master paid for those 24 hours, so really be stealing. Technically, according to my 10, you're, yeah, exactly. (laughs) And it reminds masters to treat their slaves justly because they too have a master in heaven. And at a glance, that sounds kind of good if you accept that you're, you know, talking to a slaveholder Mm -hmm. to begin with or whatever. But then you start wondering what just means if they're using the guy who drowns whole planets and orders genocide for the you part of the analogy, you know, that's, that makes it a little less impressive. Yeah, significantly so. And then we close with an entire chapter of love to dad type shit. It's yeah. Uh, Done. And, and, and here we are, two epistles later, with no new information yep. that we didn't already just read. In fact, there's nothing in this one that we just didn't read in the last one. So, yes, somehow the New Testament has found a way to be more repetitive and less applicable than the Old <laughs> Testament. That is a feat I would have deemed impossible when we finished with Malachi. It's like Paul learned nothing from the Old Testament about pacing. <laughs> you're going to have a series of extremely boring letters. You're going to need to, you know, pepper in some exciting stuff, like census data, or you know, yeah, you're going to lose our <laughs> For example, or at least a talking animal or something. So we're going to mercifully shelve our Bibles for a couple of weeks. This segment will return in three weeks with the last of the Pauline epistles and the anti, 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 anti penultimate installment of the Holy Babel. How about that Woo. shit? Hey, Lucinda, thanks again. You're welcome. Love this book. And when we come back, Bryce Blankenegel will be here for the happy ending he promised us last week.